and we want to hear what the Lord is saying to us today. Again, the Gospel of Mark, the eighth chapter, beginning our reading at verse 22. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. You may be seated. For a moment today, I want to talk from the text and the subject of what we see here in the text. We see a blind man whose vision becomes blurry, and then we see his breakthrough. So for a minute, I want to talk today from the text of the blind, the blurry, and the breakthrough. Again, uh, the blind, we see the man in the text. The blurry, we see that he saw men walking as trees, and then the breakthrough. When the man began, to see clearly. God today desires and wants for the church to see. Not with the, the, the natural vision that, that, that we think of when we think of sight, but God today wants for the church to remove the spiritual blinders so that we can see God in new ways and we can begin to see the revelation and manifestation of God in places where we normally would not expect for God to be. The body, uh, as God created man in, in Genesis, he said he created man and he made man in the image of God. God is spirit. The body is created in the image of or in the likeness of. It's not a spirit, but it's created in the image of and likeness of spirit. It's interesting when you begin to investigate and look at the body, there, there are sensory neurons. And the sensory nerves in our body allow for our senses, our, our, our hearing, our, our touch, our, our taste. They, they allow for us to receive data or receive information from the outside world. It's interesting when you begin to study the human body in the way that God has constructed and designed it because the human body, over 70%, over 70% of the sensory neurons in the human body are involved in your sense of sight. Hmm. That begins to make me think because if God created the body in the image and likeness, hmm, and over 70% of our senses are involved in sight, if we're spiritually blind, you're functioning at less than a third of your capacity. Hmm. God cannot, God, we as a church cannot afford to be spiritually blind because when we're spiritually blind, we are functioning at, at a sub part. In fact, we're functioning at a level that is way below failing. We will never carry out, we will never accomplish when we're spiritually blind, we will never carry out and accomplish the goal. We will never carry out and accomplish the, the desire, the plan of God being spiritually blind. And here in the text, God, Jesus, in fact, gives and restores sight to a blind man. And what God wants to do today in the church is some of us who are blind spiritually, some of us who have blurred vision spiritually, God wants to take the blind and the blurry. He wants to bring them to their breakthrough. Helen Keller says this, she says, the most pathetic person in the world, Helen Keller, a, a woman who, who was, in fact, blind, who, who lived a, a life where she was blind for the majority of her life, uh, she, 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 she was blind, and she says that she says the most pathetic person in the world is a person that has sight, but no vision. Uh, 
There's a difference, obviously, uh, according to Helen Keller, who, who was blind. There's a difference between sight and there's a difference uh, between sight and vision. Now, now, sight is based upon what the eyes can see. Vision is based upon what the mind perceives. There's a difference between sight and, and, and vision. And you see, when there's a disconnect between our eyes and our mind, you can know where you are and still be lost. We want to talk to the church today. You, you can be in the church. You, you can be in Sunday school. You, you can be in Sunday morning worship. You, you, you can be in the church and still be lost if your spiritual eyes are not connected with your mind. And what God wants to do today, God wants to connect our spiritual eyes with our mind. God wants to connect our spiritual eyes with our heart. God wants to connect our spiritual eyes with the inner being in ourselves. And when we begin to have this connect, understand, we will not be, like Helen Keller says, pathetic. We will not be people that do not have any vision. Uh, uh, in fact, in fact, in fact, uh, I myself have experienced, uh, have experienced uh, a, a disconnect, a disconnect, uh, my eyes seeing and mine not, not, not perceiving. I, 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 I was leaving a, a retail store, leaving a retail store, and, and I, I was looking, looking for my car, and I knew that I had parked on, on, on a certain aisle, and, and I knew approximately about where I parked, and I walked to where I knew my car was, and when I got to, to where my car was, I, I couldn't find my car. I began to think about thieves and, and robbers, and I began to think that possibly my, my, my car had, had, had been uh, possibly my car had, had been stolen. And then I, I first at first there was fear, and then there was panic, and and then there was there was even 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 a moment of, of, of anger. And and and, and, then, and I started to go back to the store, but then I realized that no one in the store could help me with the lost car. So I picked up my phone, and when, when I picked up my phone, my first call I was going to call my wife. And as I started to pick up the phone and, and call my wife. I, I, I remembered that, that I'm, I'm a steward of two vehicles. I, I have a 2007 and a 2013. And I was driving the 2013, but looking for the 2007. <laughs> my, my mind, my mind was focused on one thing, but my eyes were seeing another. I knew where I was. But, but I wasn't looking for, for what I was supposed to be looking for. And, and because of that instance, I was lost. I want the church to understand today that God has to connect our eyes with our minds so we can see what God wants us to see and be who God wants you to be and do what God wants you to do. We got to have our eyes connected with our mind. The blind, the blurry, and the breakthrough. John Lennon says this in terms of blindness, or in fact, in terms of sight. John Lennon says, living is easy with your eyes closed. And some of us have been living easy lives with our eyes closed. Some of us have been ignoring the word of God, ignoring the plan of God, and ignoring everything that God has for you in your life with your eyes closed closed. We, we have to open up our eyes to see God, to, to, to see the beauty of God. Psalms 119 verse 18 says, open thou eyes, O Lord, that I may behold the, the wondrous things of thy law. And I want you to understand that the law of the Lord is wonderful. The law of the Lord is beautiful, but the law of the Lord is the best thing that you can have in your life. But if your eyes are not open, you'll despise God's command. If your eyes are not open, you, you won't love what God loves, and you, you won't cherish what God cherished, and you won't care for what God cares for. God needs for us to open up our eyes. He needs to open up our eyes and understand even this. The New Testament tells us to fix our eyes not on that which is seen, but that which is unseen. Now, now, that lets me understand that it's not what I see with my physical eyes, but it's what I see with my spirit. God doesn't want the church to be spiritually blind. And here in Mark chapter 8, God is dealing, Jesus is dealing with spiritual blindness. If you were to look at investigated verse 18, Jesus is dealing with and talking with the disciples, and he tells the disciples, have you eyes and not see? Throughout 
the eighth chapter of Mark, God is dealing with, he's dealing with this disconnect and he have to connect our physical eyes with our spiritual eyes. He's dealing with this disconnect and even if you were to go further beyond the text, beyond verse 26, you would find where Jesus, after healing this blind man here, you would find where Jesus asked the disciples this. He asked the disciples, whom do men say that I am? And Peter professes that thou art the Christ. So even there, there is the spiritual eyesight, spiritual, spiritual eyesight being given or even demonstrated. So here it's interesting between Jesus admonishing the disciples in verse 18 and telling them, have you eyes but not see? And then in Peter's profession where he begins to see, it's interesting that in the, mir- in the middle of that smashed in right in between here is this miracle. Here, here's this miracle and it's interesting that this miracle, that this is the only miracle, the only miracle that Jesus performed where he touches a man twice. I I, I want to say that this was more than just a miracle. This was an object lesson for the disciples. Uh, This was an object lesson for the disciples to help them begin to understand that you can sometimes walk with me and and you still see blurry. (laughs) But if you continue to, to walk with me and continue to stay with me, God will give you, in fact, God will reveal and give sight. It's interesting. It's interesting in terms of the way, again, I tell you, the human body is created in the image of the spirit, and it's, it's, it's interesting in terms of how God has created the human body. The human, the human, uh, uh, it, it has eyes in the front of the human's head. Uh, animals that God has created that have eyes in the front facing forward are, are animals that know how or, in fact, that, that have the ability to hunt. Uh, eyes being placed on the side are, are defensive. <laughs> they're, they're, they're defensive and, in fact, reactionary. Hmm. So, and God has placed your eyes in the front uh, 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 in a predatory manner to, to hunt. Now, 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 what is it that God has created you to hunt or, in fact, let's change hunt to search? What has God created you to search for with eyes focused toward the front? God has created mankind to search <laughs> for his presence. God has created mankind to search for his instruction. God has created mankind to long for and thirst after God. God has placed our eyes in a position where we are taught, in fact, we, we, are, we are framed, in fact, formed to seek after God. Uh, in the text, there, there's a man who has eyes, but the man cannot see. Mm-hmm. He cannot see, and when we look at the text, this man who has eyes but cannot see, it, it says that the people, it, it says that the, the, the company of people brought this man, in verse 22, they brought this man to Jesus. They brought this man to Jesus and they besought, they, they asked Jesus to, to, to touch him. Now, the, the word touch him actually means lay hold of or lay a firm grip upon him. Hmm. Now, now, it's interesting when you look at the text because this man who was blind did not ask to be healed. It's interesting when you look at the text because this man who was blind was not asking even to be brought to Jesus. It's interesting when you look at the text that there are others that are bringing this blind man to Jesus for this blind man to be healed. I want to tell us today that that we need to make sure that we pray for those in our families who are not saved. I I want us to understand today that we need to pray for those that we know that are lost. I I want us to understand today that we need to still bring them, point them, and direct them to Jesus. We, we, We need to bring them to Jesus, and when we bring them to Jesus, it's not our job to give them sight, but but, but Jesus, but God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will help them see what we cannot show them. It'll help them know what we cannot help them to know. The people brought this man to Jesus, and the man, the man did not ask to be healed. And and the man, it's interesting that this man did not ask to be healed. This man not asking to to be healed, it's interesting. He's spiritually blind and did not want, didn't have the desire. Nowhere between verses 22 and 26 did this man ask to be healed. Those who are spiritually blind will not ask to be healed because many of us don't want to deal with the responsibility that comes with seeing. 
uh, when there begins to be a connect between our eyes and our spirit, understand there's responsibility that comes along with that. The responsibility that comes along with that is now that I see, now that I know God, now now I, I, I can't lay in my bed on, on, on Sunday morning because I know that God has been too good. I, I, I can't, I, I, I can't just, just, just sit out of a, a Bible study and, and Sunday school because God has been making a way for me all through the week and if God has been making a way for me then, then I need to make a way to get to his presence and, and get to the place uh, where I can learn more of him. Uh, it's interesting, it's interesting this blind man did not ask to be healed and they asked Jesus to lay hold of this man. Jesus, Jesus, in fact, he, he, he touches the man, but it's interesting when he touches the man, he, he took the blind man by the hand in verse 23. Now, so when he took the blind man by the hand, that means he touched him. But the touch that he took the blind man by the hand was not a transformative touch, it was a leading touch. What do you do in your life? When, when, when you come to God or, or when you're seeking a transformative touch and God doesn't give you a transformative touch but God gives you a, a leading touch. God, Jesus, gives him a leading touch and leads him away from the place where he was and leads him away from all of the other people. Now, why would Jesus lead him away? Now, this blind man, I understand that people that are blind have a heightened ability in terms of their other senses. They have a heightened sense of touch. They have a heightened sense of smell, a heightened sense of taste, and a heightened sense of hearing. Their other senses begin to pick up and, and, and work at, at, at levels beyond what those who can see function. Uh, and now there was a crowd of people here and Jesus leads the man away from the crowd because the other senses of this man were distracting the healing of the sense that needed to be restored. I want you to understand in your life that sometimes God gives you a leading touch because God is trying to lead you away from distractions. God is trying to lead you away from people and influences that are stopping you from seeing God. God is trying to lead you away from things that are taking the taste of God out of your mouth and putting the taste of sin in your mouth. God is trying to lead you away from people that are putting negative thoughts in your ear and the thoughts that they put in your ear end up in your mind. And if it ends up in your mind, then it blocks the connect between your eyes and your your mind. That's what God really wants to do. So sometimes God leads you out. Sometimes God leads you away from the influences so that God can speak to you alone. And God sometimes will get you in a quiet place, in a, in a solitary place. God will sometimes get you in a place where there's nobody but you and God. And when you get in that place where it's just you and God, then God can minister to you in a unique way. Then God can minister to you in a transformative way. Because the man had a leading touch before he had a transformative touch. I want you to understand that today, that what you first need to do if you're looking for God to do your miracle, if you're looking for God to deliver you, if you're looking for God to, to, to move you from where you are and take you to the plateau of praise and get you to a place in, in worship and get you to a place in understanding and knowing the will of God, the first thing that you got to do is follow the leading touch of God and when God leads you into a place where it's no Nobody but you and him. Then God will give you a transformative. He'll give you a transformative touch. God, God gives this man, he in fact, he gives this man a transformative touch. But, but before God can, can give this man a transformative touch, first God, God, he, Jesus, he spit in the man's face. There, there are three miracles within the Bible where Jesus spits. There's a miracle where he spits on his fingers and sticks his fingers in a man's ear and says, Ephata, and allows the man to hear. There, there's another miracle in the text where, where in, in the Bible where Jesus spits in mud. He makes uh, he, clay and he puts the mud or the clay on the man's eyes and the man begins to see. Hmm. But, but here, Jesus spit in the man's eyes. Or oh, in fact, he spit in the man's face. When he spit in the man's face, then the man's vision became blurry. Hmm. Jesus humili took this man from the people that he was with, in the city that he was living in, 
pulled him out to a solitary place, and then he spit in his face. He humiliated the man. What do you do when God spits in your face? What do you do when, when God puts you in, in, in a place where, where there's nothing but humility? Uh, what do you do? And understand, God will sometimes put us in that place to show us that it's not about us, but it's really about God. God will sometimes put us in that place because what God really wants to see, God really wants to see your heart bare. God, God really wants to see your heart without any of the coverings that we normally try to protect ourselves with. God wants to see you if you really love him. And God takes this man to a place. And what, 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 what do you do when, when God puts you in a position where you've been praying for, for years for, for something to come to pass in your life and what you've been praying for God never answers your prayer. What do you do? What do you do in a situation where you expected God to transform and turn the situation around, but God hadn't turned the situation around? God keeps turning you around. What, 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 what do you do in, in that type of situation where, 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 where it seems like God is not listening? What, what do you do in the type of situation where when sometimes it seems like God doesn't care for what you care for? What do you do in the type of situation where you you don't know how to respond and you don't know what to do. What do you do when, when it seems like everything around you is dark and, and there's no light? Well, what do you do in, in a situation where it seems like God is not listening to your prayers, not, not listening to your pleas, not listening? Well, what do you do? This, this man in the text, what, what he did is he was honest. <laughs> He was honest because after Jesus, after Jesus spit in the man's eyes, Jesus asked him, can you see? Now, the man had some vision now, but not good vision. He was honest. And what God wants for you to do in that situation, in the situation, God wants you to continue to be honest. God wants you to be honest with God in a solitary place. And understand that sometimes God gets you to a solitary place. Sometimes God gets you to that type of place because when God gets you to a solitary place then you begin to have blurry vision you begin to have blurry vision because now God I, I can see some things but God I can't see clear and when you get to the point in your life where you can see some things but you can't see 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 clear sometimes you need a second touch it's the only miracle in the Bible where Jesus heals with a second touch but 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 first but first but first what what is it that caused this man to have blurry what is it that caused this man to have blurry vision uh, uh, if we look at Bethsaida we look at Bethsaida Bethsaida is, Bethsaida is one of three cities that, that Jesus Jesus said, woe unto Jesus actually pronounced and said, it's better for you. Uh, it'll be better for, for the unsaved in the end time. He said, a woe unto Bethsaida, because they were a people who did not believe. They, they were a people, the city would not repent. Uh, uh, so, so, so God heals. God, in fact, brings this man out of this city. Uh, he brings this man out of the city, and what do you do? Uh, he brings you out of the city, and when he brings him out of the city, he spits in his eyes, and now his vision is 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 blurry. Yeah. His vision is blurry, but it's interesting that Jesus, the man, he's honest in terms of telling Jesus that he actually cannot see clearly. He cannot see clearly, and Jesus, in turn, now touches the man a second time. Now, now, there's something about the second touch that I need for you to get. <laughs> see, see, understand, with the first touch, Jesus didn't give the man any directions. He just asked him, what do you see? If you look in the text, with the second touch, it says that Jesus told him to look up. Uh, I, I want you to understand that, that, that see, sometimes <laughs> with the second touch, God's going to give you some directions. And when you're honest, God will understand that you'll be obedient. And when you're honest, God understands that you'll be obedient. He'll tell you to look up. And when the man began to look up, it says that then the man began to see 
clearly. I want you to understand that in terms of God giving you clear sight, you can't look out, but you got to look up. And see, when God gives you the, the touch, you can't look out at the world. You got to look up because understand the world is what caused this man to have blurry vision. The, the world is what caused this man to not be able to see the way that God wanted for the man to see. God spit upon this man. He spit upon this man and actually touched the man twice. Now, why did God have to touch the man twice? He touched the man twice. Some theologians believe that in touching the man twice, part of it was showing that some things in our life occur as a process. Uh, every miracle, e every deliverance, every transformation, every healing is not always instant. Sometimes it occurs as a process. Now, 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 now some theologians say that said it was really about this people's unbelief. He had to touch the man twice because he came from a city of people who had unbelief, so he had to touch him twice. And even the Bible records that Jesus could do little miracles there because of their lack of belief. But, but, but in the end, it's also a parable in touching him twice to show the disciples that, that you can be with me and you can have some sight, but the some sight that you have is not the more sight that you need. Now, he touched, he touched, he touched this man twice, and I'm so glad that Jesus touches twice. I, I'm so glad that Jesus touches twice because as I understand it and I look at my Bible, the first time Jesus came, Jesus came and touched my, touched my sin, and then the Holy Spirit came and touched my soul. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that Jesus touches twice because understand when God touches God gives you sight now this was not just about giving sight but can I understand this so okay in fact can I tell you this it was not just about giving sight but when Jesus came through this was about showing how God was going to do some things in life it's showing about how God was going to actually breathe and bring about salvation because see when it begins to talk about this touch and tight and God giving sight understand when I begin to look at Calvary Calvary was all about sight it was all about us seeing and in fact God seeing. It was about God seeing and God's sight. Because understand on Calvary, God had hindsight. <laughs> there was insight and there was foresight. Because <laughs> see, when I begin to think about Calvary, it, it was hindsight because God was looking back over the past sins of man. And when he was looking back over the past sins of man and looking at the fact that man could not get it right, that man could not follow him like God wanted him to follow him, that was hindsight. But then it was insight because Jesus on the cross said Father forgive them for they know not what they do. It was insight because Jesus on the cross said Father into thy hands I commit my spirit. It, it was hindsight and it was insight but it was also foresight because I wasn't there but it was foresight because somewhere down the line somewhere in history's past God saw me along the way there was hindsight, there was insight and there was foresight I'm glad about Calvary because what Calvary was really about was about the sight of God seeing me in the seeing me in the path of time. And when God saw me in the path of time, God had a miracle waiting for me. God wanted me to be able to see Him clearly. God wanted me to be able to worship Him dearly. God wanted me to be able to love Him with all of my heart and all of my mind and all of my soul. And I'm so glad that God had sight when I could not see. I'm so so glad that God wanted to remove in fact not wanted but did remove my spiritual blindness sometimes my vision is cloudy but if I can focus my eyes up if I can look up to Jesus there is salvation if I can look up to Jesus there is my joy if I can look up to Jesus there is my healing there is my deliverance there is my peace if I can look up to Jesus and God wants somebody today to understand in the midst of a situation that you don't understand in the midst of a situation where you don't know your way out God wants you today to look up look up to Jesus and when you look up to Jesus God will do wonderful things for you God will make a miracle in your life God will begin to live with you God will give you the strength that you need to hold on when you don't have a will to hold on. God will help you keep on keeping on when you don't have a keep on. God will allow you to keep on moving when your feet don't want to move. God will allow you to keep on standing when your legs don't want to stand. God will allow you to keep on praising when everything about you says there's nothing to pray. God today wants you to understand that you need to have sight 
and not just blurry vision. God wants you to have clear sight. And when you have clear sight, then you can see God as he is and you can see him in his glory and you can see him in his majesty. You can see him in his power. And when I see him in his glory, when I see him in his power, when I see him in his majesty, then I begin to know that God can do anything. God can do all things. God can work my situation out. God can work the disease out. God can work the stress out. God can deliver a wayward child. God can bring those that haven't been home. God can bring them back home. And what God really wants for you to do is see like God sees and know like God knows and love like God loves. That's what God really wants. God wants to get you to a place where you got sight. God wants to get you to a place where you see clearly. God wants to get you to a place where you begin to walk with him and, and talk with him and walk as if you're his own. God wants to get you to that place. That's what God really wants to do. God wants some believers that can see. God wants some believers that can know. God wants some believers that can do. That's what God really wants to do. God wants to help you deal with the difficult times. But you got to focus. You got to fix. You got to put your eyes on Jesus. Not man. Not woman. Not your mother. Not your father. Not your brother. Not a spouse. God wants you to put your eyes on him. And when you put your eyes on him, God will allow you to see things that nobody else will see. God will allow you to know things that nobody else will know. God will give you. God will give you 